I spoke of this a little bit earlier. Uh, that beginning next Sunday, uh, I think Pastor Joe's going to be kicking off a teaching series, a three-part series. We're calling It Takes a Church. Um, and what it's going to do, it's going to be focusing in on the heart of God and how we can be expressions of caring for the needs of others. And what you're going to discover about Bethany Church is, is that we do have a big heart. Amen. And the reason is because is God has a big heart and we want to care for people in their moment of need because that is who God is. And so I'm looking forward to Bruce and, and, uh, and Joe helping to teach through that. And also I wanted you to know once that wraps up, I'm going to be kicking off a summer teaching series and we're calling it um, Lessons from the Lesser Known. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be taking a look at the biblical characters in the Old Testament that maybe you've never heard of before. And we're going to go old school for the summer months and we'll be looking looking at some character qualities in their life uh, and how that applies to our life. So I'm looking forward uh, to that as well. Hey, just one quick last thing I wanted to do before we jump into our text is I wanted to brag on you, church. I challenged you two weeks ago to make sure that Father's Day was not going to be super lame around this place. And for those of you that made it a priority to be here, because a lot of times in the church world, there's like three really big Sundays. There's Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day. And everybody goes to church with mom, and then Father's Day comes around, and people are like, I'm going to watch NASCAR. You know what I mean? I go to church, right? And so what we did is we just, we said, hey, what would it look like if we just all made going to church a priority? And I got incredible news for you. We only had five fewer people in church last Sunday than Mother's Day. Let's give it up for you, church family. That was amazing. And I just want to say way to go. And if you count our online Online attendance, we actually had more people here. Uh, so we're like, so we're counting you, uh, online folks, when you're watching NASCAR and church at the same time. Um, last weekend, uh, we ran out of some of our gifts for our dudes, our men. And so uh, Joe, I believe, and or uh, Pastor Bruce are going to be making those available. They may or not may not have been Bethany pocket knives. And so we have some more of those. If you didn't get one of those last week over at the Connection Center, right after our services, we'll be doing that. And then just lastly, you're going to be noticing over the course of the next couple of weeks, there's going to be some construction projects happening around the campus. We figure there's never a great time to do that, um, but we want to make sure that we're gearing up for the fall. And so you'll be noticing maybe some different flooring in this room, in the fellowship center. Some of our classrooms are going to be getting uh, remodeled um, in addition to some other projects around the campus. And even some of the, the kitchens going to be having some work done in the kitchen as well. So, so just wanted you to know, uh, progress takes uh, some resources. So thank you for making it possible for us to get our facility ready for an incredible fall. God is good. Amen, church? All righty. Hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump into and wrap up our teaching series on the fruit of the Spirit. We're calling it Fruitful, where our goal is to grow in the likeness of Jesus Christ. There's been a passage we've been looking at for 10 weeks in a row, and it comes out of the New Testament, the book of Galatians. It says these words right here, but the Holy Spirit, who produces everyone? The what? The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what, everyone? Self-control. Thanks, Joe, for doing a good job with that last week. I'm glad I didn't have to preach that message. Um, and what we did is every week we kind of looked at one of those different virtues, one of those different values, one of those different qualities that the Holy Spirit produces in our life. And then today we're going to focus in on this odd little last statement. There is no law against these things. So with that being said, let's just pray quickly. So Lord, we just commit this time to you. We, we commit not my words, but God, your words. Uh, would they be uh, edifying? Would they be um, alive and active? Would they be useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the men and the women of God can become thoroughly equipped for every good work? That is my prayer. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, during this series, our focus has been on the, uh, on the what. Like, what is the fruit of the Spirit? But today, we're going to move into action. We're going to move into the how. How do we become faithful followers of Jesus? You see, I've, I've got this, this idea that I'm wanting to leave you with, and this is this idea that I'm going to close with, and it's the idea is it's that the connection between the both and, it's, it's in and through our lives. We're allowing Jesus both in and through our lives to live that way. There's some things that are better together, I believe, like chips and salsa, amen? They're better together. Salsa on their own, okay, 
with chips, heavenly, right? Especially Bobby Salazar's. Um, iced tea and lemonade, they're pretty good on their own. But I tell you what, you put them together and you make Arnold Palmer smile. The same is true both in and out, not either or. The what and the how. The what is the fruit of the Spirit. But Jesus shares about how this all comes together. Uh, our, our text this morning is going to be going deeper into a teaching of Jesus where he talks about in John 15. I'm going to focus in on the first five verses. And Jesus says these words. He says that I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that, uh, in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And he goes on to say, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit. No branch can what, everyone? Bear fruit. And as you're thinking to yourself, man, we're talking about like, like fruitfulness. And you're saying, Jesus, that I can't bear fruit. Notice what happens next. By itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Jesus says famously, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, that you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do what, everyone? Nothing, nada. These are some of the last words that Jesus would speak the night before he would die on a cross for your sins and mine. And Jesus was making some promises. He was saying, it's as though I'm going to be physically absent. My body will be in heaven. I will be, res I will be ascending into heaven. My spirit will come upon you and fill you. That's going to be on the day of Pentecost. Jesus was talking about this analogy. And it reminds all of us of how interconnected our lives are in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ. And how it is essential for us to become like Christ and fruitful, as Paul talks about. You see, if you're taking notes, I want to give you a couple of observations. The first is simply this, is that fruitfulness is the proof of being a disciple. That when you, when you see the fruitfulness of the Spirit in another person's life, it reveals Jesus in and through their life. Jesus talks about this in other places. Um, in Matthew 7, verse 16, Jesus says, By their fruit, you will recognize them. Recognize who? You're going to recognize that a person is a Jesus follower by how they're living their life and if they're manifesting love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. You see, a lot of times Christians are, are blamed for being so judgmental. The truth is, is we've not been called to judge. We have been called, though, to be fruit inspectors. You know, you go to your favorite fruit stand on the side of the road, and they can taste pretty good sometimes, but the truth is, is they've not been inspected They've just come right out of the dirt. They're right there. And some of you are like, no better way. We live in Fresno. And I agree. But there are other parts of the world that unless that fruit has been inspected, you do not want to put that fruit in your body. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's something very comforting to know. There's a seal on the fruit that it has been inspected. And as disciples, we have been called to become spiritual fruit inspectors. And if we don't see spiritual fruit in our life or in the life of other people, we should be very concerned, like buyer beware. And why is that? Because in our world, we're being told that there are certain things that we do that, that, that make a person more valuable or more attractive or more desirable. A lot of times, to put it there on your notes, is that we confuse success with being fruitful, we think to a person just if they're successful in business or if they're attractive or if they're funny, then somehow they're blessed. But the truth is, is that spiritual fruitfulness has nothing to do with those things. You see, worldly success brings attention to us, notoriety to us, but spiritual success brings glory to God. I'm going to say that one more time. Spiritual success brings glory to who, everyone? God. See, Jesus goes on to say this in verse 8 that this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You see, when, when, when we are fruitful spiritually, God gets the glory. And so when Christians live this way, what we're showing is, is that we're, we're authentic, that we're, that we're healthy, that, that, we've, that, that, that we've passed the Inspection On your notes, I wrote that an authentic Christian is a fruitful follower 
of Jesus. And the fruitfulness is going to be seen. It's going to be manifested in a disciple's life. And, and there's going to be seeds of this in their life that are going to then be reproduced into other people's lives. Spiritually speaking, a spiritual disciple of Jesus reproduces themselves in other people's lives. And I suppose we can ask ourselves the question, if I'm not reproducing myself into somebody else's life, am I really a disciple? That discipleship is the seed of salvation that Christ wants to grow deep into our life and wants to grow and be multiplied in other people's lives. You see, fruitfulness is an outward expression of an inward reality. And so if there's a lack of fruitfulness in our life, we have to look in the spiritual mirror and say, Lord God, am I being loving, peaceful? Am I being patient? Am I being kindness? And if I'm not, that means not try harder but rather ask the Holy Spirit to say, God, why not? Why am I lacking? What in my life needs to change to allow the fruitfulness to continue in my life? You see, there's, there's certain things in our life that when we begin to look at that lack of an inward reality that we have to say, God, why? What's going on? What's happening? You see, a lot of times we hear this phrase in life, just fake it till you make it. The truth is there's a lot of fake Christians in this world that they say one thing and they do something completely different. And I just want to go ahead and say they, the reason why they can't fake it is because you cannot long-term fake spiritual growth. When you just do it on your own, when you're just trying harder, it never works out. The same is true with leaves. That leaves on a tree do not mean that the tree is being fruitful. Let me say that again. Only branches attached to the tree produce fruit. You see, when a person is just religious and they're just going through all the religious exercises and just putting on the smile and doing good things, even, even really good things, but if they're doing under their own strength and not under the power of God, what happens is, is that they're trying to bear fruit that God never intended for them to bear. I want you to write this down. Write this down. Disciples bear the fruit that Jesus produces. Christians don't produce fruit. Who produces fruit? Jesus does. The Holy Spirit does. We don't try harder. Actually, we die so that life can come through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a distinct difference between producing and bearing fruit. That a branch just simply shows off what the vine is producing, but Jesus is the vine and Christians are the branches. I wrote it down this way in your notes. The branches don't produce fruit. They only bear fruit. It was a couple weeks ago, I had the privilege of speaking on meekness. And I gave uh, us all the, the Meek Week seven-day challenge. And I had people come up to me afterwards and say, that was so hard. It was so challenging. I just kept on failing at being meek. And I, and I didn't want to say, hey, wait for two more weeks when I, when I remind you that we don't try to be meek. If we're trying to be meek, we're missing out on it. That rather meekness is something that as we grow closer to Jesus, it begins to be revealed in our life. Is this making sense, everybody? It's actually impossible to try to be meek. You either are or you're not based on the Holy Spirit's action and through your life. See, the Bible says this. Jesus is teaching verse 4 on our notes today. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Let me say as clearly as I can. Branches don't produce fruit. They only bear fruit. Branches don't produce fruit. They just bear fruit. And the key is, is remaining attached to the vine. On your notes, I wrote this. That fruit cannot be manufactured. It is only displayed. Uh, when you go south on the 99, and I've made this trip a lot lately, um, when you get down to uh, the beautiful city of, um, I don't know, I think it's Delano, uh, on the left, there's this big packing house where they make these um, halo fruit. Have you seen the halo packing on the left? And you're like, man, how big are those oranges that they had? Got to be that big, right? And it's a beautiful hybrid crop. It's, it's, they're produced by the wonderful food company, which I think owns half of California. And what we know is, is what happens inside of the, the halo fruit uh, plant is that fruit is not grown in there. 
Rather, it is processed there and it is shipped around the world. And the same is true in our lives. We don't produce fruit, but rather fruit is produced in our lives and then it is sent literally like a halo around the world. Am I making sense? You see, farmers and ranchers grow fruit and they do that with the proper mix of soil and water and sunlight. And Christians, we don't grow fruit. The farmer does. And who's the farmer? Our heavenly father. He's the farmer. And we're just merely a part of the distribution business. Am I making sense? We're here to distribute through our, the Holy Spirit, our heavenly rancher, the, pro, the produce that he's growing in and through our lives. This last week I was uh, here uh, on, on one night and it, whether you've been here in the evening, out in, in the front yard there are some, some string lights that are out there. They're beautiful. Uh, we have them there for Journey to Bethlehem, but they're, they're up. We like them so much we've kept them up year round. Well, this last week I noticed that the, the rope lights, uh, only one half of them were working and the other half weren't working. And, and I'm like, well, I guess those rope lights are broken. So I'm getting on Amazon, I'm looking to go buy some more rope lights, and then I, I get over and I realize that the rope lights that weren't working were not what everyone plugged in. So I'm a good steward of the Lord's resources. We save $39. But I began to wonder to myself, how often do we go out and try to manufacture something when the truth is, is that we're just not spiritually plugged in? And we see that there's light in someone else's life and we wonder why there's not light in our life and we realize is that we've never come to a place where we've allowed the Holy Spirit to indwell us and empower us to shine for the world to see. If you've never made that decision, today is that opportunity for you to allow there to be a supernatural change in and through your life. You see, the fruit of the Spirit, it illuminates in a believer's life that a Christian must, though, remain attached. They must be connected to the source, and the source is Jesus. Christians don't produce fruit. We simply shine the light to a watching world. Amen. Now, this next part is going to be the hardest part, but i got to say it anyway. If you would, write this down. Branches that are pruned produce more fruit. Branches that are pruned produce more fruit. Uh, in this particular passage, Jesus talks about fruitfulness on three different levels. First, he talks about bearing fruit. Second, bearing much fruit. Third, bearing more fruit. And the only way that a branch can produce more fruit is if it is pruned. Verse two says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that does bear fruit though, he, pr he prunes so that it will be what, everyone? Even more what? Fruitful. See, I just wanna remind us all of this analogy so we can keep it straight. Jesus is the vine. Say that out loud with me. Jesus is the vine, and our heavenly Father is the gardener. Say, my heavenly Father is the gardener, and that we as Christians, we're the branches. Say, I'm a branch. Look to the person to your right, say, I'm a branch. Now, no one's sitting to your right, turn to the left, say, you're still a branch, all right. See, hypothetically, guys, let's just say that Christians um, have been walking with Jesus for years. People should see the fruit of the Spirit in and through their lives. Amen? I mean, in a perfect world, that that would just be the case, that we're just going to have a bunch of fruity Christians out there. I mean that in the best spiritual way. But then in the midst of Christians doing what Christians do, and they're being loving and patient and kind and gentle and self-controlled, then all of a sudden when someone's just like, I mean, they're just, their life is like a halo. They can just see the Holy Spirit into their life and then their life gets harpooned. Situations and circumstances in their life, physically, emotionally, relationally, financially, they experience, for a lack of a better word, a pruning, a cutting, and it's fair to think, and maybe some of you right now are in a season of pruning. It's fair to say, God, did I do something wrong? Did I, did, did I miss out? Like, I know, like, I know Pastor Brent wanted me to be here for Father's Day. I wasn't. Is that why I'm getting pruned this week, you know? The truth is, is that trees that are not pruned eventually stop producing fruit. 
An unpruned tree becomes a shade tree. And a shade tree that is not pruned will ultimately fall over and die. And, and when we begin to think about trees that are being pruned and they're being cut, they don't look great during the winter. But I'll tell you what, in the spring and the summer, they're beautiful because they produce a beautiful harvest. You see, pruning is painful in the moment, but is essential for fruitfulness. For those of you that are, that are going through some painful seasons right now, it is possible that the Lord is allowing your life to be pruned. Sorry, not sorry. It's just the way the heavenly farmer, Holy Spirit, does it. And there are some of you right now that you're like, ouch, Lord, do you really have to cut that away? Do you really have to prune that branch? I love the way it produces comfortable shade in my life. But the truth is, is that the Heavenly Father prunes those who he loves. I was doing some research on, on uh, pruning this week, and I learned something really interesting. That when even a tree that is regularly pruned, when it begins to lose its fruitfulness, and a farmer will go with an axe and begin to just cut away at the tree a bit. You'll see scars on the tree. And that what happens is, is that the tree, because of that pain, because of that cut, because of that, of that little whatever it is, the sap begins to grow. And as the sap begins to grow, it then germinates something from a seed level in the church that says, uh, from, from within itself, that says, I must produce fruit. And so what we need to realize is that when we're going through seasons of pain and suffering, that God can use those seasons. And for some of you, you're pretty scarred up. For some of you, you've got the wounds to prove it. Some of you literally have the wounds to prove it. And I just want to tell you that if you'll trust God and his sovereignty in your life, God will never waste a hurt. I'm going to say that one more time because your response was kind of lame. If you'll trust him and you'll believe that God is good, even in the midst of the pains of your life, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a dream, a detour, a disappointment, a disillusionment, that if you'll trust him, God will never waste a hurt. Amen. Amen. You have to believe that, everybody. You just have to. We can clap. We should clap for that, everyone. We believe that. Now, some of you are like, I'm clapping right now, but only because you're asking me to. Because this stinks. I don't like it. And that's okay. God loves you. See, we look at people that are spiritual giants and we just think that they had it so easy. The Apostle Paul, for example. Oh, he just had a cakewalk. It was just all handed to him, right? No, not at all. Let me read for you just a little excerpt of his, of his life journal. Five times, Paul says, I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. By the way, that's, that's not like going in and having feathers waved at you. That's called being beaten the way Jesus was beaten before he was crucified. Minus one was almost up until death. Three times I was beaten by rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move, meaning I don't really know where I'm going to live. There's a lot of uncertainty. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, Danger from my fellow Jews, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false believers. I've labored, I've toiled, I've even gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Boy, oh boy, how many of us, if we read that, when we said yes to Jesus, we'd have probably said, can I pray about that? So a lot of times we think that the moment that you accept Jesus Christ that all of a sudden life is just going to get incrementally easier and it doesn't. Sometimes it gets harder. But in the midst of the hurt, God is good all the time. Amen. Amen. See, the physical lashes produce spiritual fruit in Paul's life, similar to the lashes on a tree, produced more fruitfulness for believers. And I just want you to know for those of you that are going through it, for those of you that are saying, man, I want my life, my ministry to be something great like Paul. Do you really? I believe the greatness of God's 
grace in and through Paul's life was because of the, the journey that Paul had to journey on, the road that he had to walk. So if I could summarize this message, this series, into this idea, like a next step, if you would just write this down, please, is that you would stay connected to Jesus. Is that you would stay connected to Jesus. Jesus says it best, he says it most clearly in John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you're the branches. If you let everyone remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do what, church? Nothing, nada. We have to remain in him. Apart from him, we'll never be loving enough, patient enough, gentle enough. It's all dependent on our dependency on him. It's our responsibility to remain. I thought you might find this interesting. Our, our church's denominational affiliation is the Mennonite brethren. And, and that word minnow, it's, it's, it's not this. It was a man by the name of Minnow Simons. And people called them Mennonites. And it wasn't like a good thing, by the way. It's a bad thing. It's like the first time people called them Christians, it was a slang. It wasn't a positive thing. But the word minnow, I did a word study. And in the word, the minnow actually means to stay connected to. And in the King James Version of the Bible, the word minnow means abiding or clinging to with complete dependence. And so if you're serious about being a Jesus follower for the long haul, if you're serious about allowing the likeness of Jesus Christ to be seen in and through your life, you need to be a minnow. You need to allow for there to be complete dependence on Jesus for your ongoing fruitfulness. That word actually shows up 10 times in our passage. It means being completely dependent on Jesus. You know, a branch is completely dependent on the vine for its life, just like Christians are completely dependent on our life in Jesus Christ. That the branch is just simply an extension of the vine. And a lot of times we get this backwards. We think that, you know what, I'm the vine and Jesus, you're just an extension of what I'm doing. And the truth is, is that's completely opposite from reality. My plans, my goals, my aspirations, my timeline, my agenda, at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's all about him. Amen, church? Jesus is not an add-on or an attachment. He is our life source. You know, it reminds me of the psalmist that says these words, that blessed is going to be the one, Bethany, who delights in the law of the Lord, who meditates on the law day and night. The person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in season, whose leaves do not wither, whether they do, whatever they do prospers. And so that is a word. That's an idea that I want to leave you with, is how can we remain faithful spiritually? We're going to stay connected. We're we're going to be meditating on God's word regularly, We're going to be staying committed with each other. We're not going to give up meeting together as some in the habit are doing. We're going to look for opportunities to serve, not our agenda, but for his glory. We're going to continue to say, all that I have isn't mine, it's his. And we're going to continue to say, you know what? I'm completely dependent on you. I am minnow on you. I cling to you. I'm dependent on you. My source of life is dependent on you. And when the Lord does allow us to be disciplined, does allow us to be pruned, I want to remind you, it's not because necessarily we've done something wrong, but it's because of the heart of the Father is love. And he allows those who he loves at times to be pruned, at times to be disciplined, because that's what loving parents do. Do you believe that, church? As I prepare to close, and the band makes their way on up here to the front, I just want to give you this idea this, this, this idea of what the Lord is wanting to do. He, he is wanting to live in and through our lives. The Holy Spirit is going to produce love. The Holy Spirit is going to produce joy. The Holy Spirit is going to produce peace. The Holy Spirit is going to produce patience. The Holy Spirit is going to produce kindness. The Holy Spirit is going to produce goodness. The Holy Spirit is going to produce faithfulness. The Holy Spirit is going to produce gentleness. The Holy Spirit is going to produce self-control. So allow Jesus to live his life through your life. You don't have to try harder. You don't have to try to be fruitful. The Holy Spirit wants you to display his fruit 
to the watching world. Our band is going to close in this song, and the song is about the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm not sure which one of those fruit that you know that you need in your life, but I pray that that would be your prayer, that you would just yield your life, that you would, that you would acknowledge that you need to be in closer community and connection with him. Maybe you've realized that you've not given your life to Christ, that you've been like the unplugged lights outside. Can I encourage you during this time to say yes to Jesus, to acknowledge your need for a savior, your sinfulness, and lean into him. During this time of worship, um, our, our, some of our deacons, our prayer team are gonna make themselves available to pray with you. If you'd like prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to pray for you. Also, if this is the time that we get to celebrate the end of our service with some baptisms, and if you've not yet out of obedience said yes to Jesus to be baptized, then I'm gonna ask you to head on over to the Connection Center over there. There's some towels, there's some shorts, there's some shirts, and we're ready. And uh, as Crystal said, it's a hot tub. It's a warm tub now. It was hot earlier, it's, it's warm now. But I'll tell you what, it still works. We're baptized not to save us, but rather to say yes out of obedience upon our salvation. And it's something that we all do um, because Jesus said to do it. He modeled it. So would you stand to your feet? Let me close our time in prayer. So Holy Spirit, now, would you just go ahead and do something real in and through our lives? Would you allow this song to just be a, a seal of this series? Um, God, for those that are getting ready to say yes to you out of obedience through baptism, I pray that this would just be an incredibly meaningful time in and through their lives. But for all of us now, we create this space and this time to allow your word to penetrate in and through our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. And if this is your prayer, church, would you please say amen and amen.